This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Chapter 13, Part 2, recorded by Bob Foster, Montreal, March 2006. Edie Boardman asked Tommy Caffrey was he done, and he said yes. So then she buttoned up his little knickerbockers for him and told him to run off and play with Jackie and to be good now and not to fight. But Tommy said he wanted the ball, and Edie told him no, that Baby was playing with the ball, and if he took it there'd be wigs on the green, but Tommy said it was his ball, and he wanted his ball, and he pranced on the ground, if you please, the temper of him. Oh, he was a man already, was little Tommy Caffrey, since he was out of pennies. Edie told him no, no, and to be off now with him, and she told Sissy Caffrey not to give in to him. You're not my sister, naughty Tommy said. It's my ball. But Sissy Caffrey told Baby Boardman to look up, look up high at her finger, and she snatched the ball quickly and threw it along the sand, and Tommy after it in full career, having won the day. Anything for a quiet life, laughed Sis. And she tickled Tiny Tot's two cheeks to make him forget, and played, Here is the Lord Mayor, here is his two horses, here is his gingerbread carriage, and here he walks in, chin chopper, chin chopper, chin chopper, chin. But Edie got as cross as two sticks about him getting his own way like that from everyone always petting him. I'd like to give him something, she said, so I would, where I won't say. On the bee toady Tom, laughed Sissy merrily. Gertie McDowell bent down her head and crimsoned at the idea of Sissy saying an unladylike thing like that out loud she'd be ashamed of her life to say, flashing a deep rosy red, and Edie Boardman said she was sure the gentleman opposite heard what she said, but not a pen cared Sis. Let him, she said with a pert toss of her head and a piquant tilt of her nose, give it to him too on the same place as quick as I'd look at him. Madcap Sis with her gollywog curls. You had to laugh at her sometimes. For instance, when she asked you, would you have some more Chinese tea and jazzberry ram? And when she drew the jugs too and the men's faces on her nails with red ink, make you split your sides, or when she wanted to go where you know, she said she wanted to run and pay a visit to the Miss White. That was just like Sissy comes Oh, and will you ever forget the evening she dressed up in her father's suit and hat and the burnt cork moustache and walked down Tritonville Road smoking a cigarette? There was none to come up to her for fun, but she was sincerity itself, one of the bravest and truest hearts heaven ever made, not one of your two-faced things too sweet to be wholesome. And then there came out upon the air the sound of voices and the pealing anthem of the organ. It was the men's temperance retreat conducted by the missioner, the Reverend John Hughes, S.J., Rosary, Sermon, and Benediction of the Most Blessed Sacrament. They were there gathered together without distinction of social class, and a most edifying spectacle it was to see in that simple fane beside the waves after the storms of this weary world kneeling before the feet of the Immaculate, reciting the litany of Our Lady of Loretto, beseeching her to intercede for them, the old familiar words, Holy Mary, Holy Virgin of Virgins. How sad to poor Gertie's ears! Had her father only avoided the clutches of the demon drink by taking the pledge or those powders the drink habit cured in Pearson's Weekly, she might now be rolling in her carriage, second to none. Over and over had she told herself that, as she mused by the dying embers in a brown study without the lamp, because she hated two lights, or oftentimes gazing out of the window dreamily by the hour at the rain falling on the rusty bucket, thinking, but that vile decoction which has ruined so many hearths and homes had cast its shadow over her childhood days. Nay, she had even witnessed in the home circle deeds of violence caused by intemperance, and had seen her own father, a prey to the fumes of intoxication, forget himself completely, for if there was one thing of all things that Gertie knew, it was the man who lifts his hand to a woman, save in the way of kindness, deserves to be branded as the lowest of the low. 
and still the voices sang in supplication to the virgin most powerful virgin most merciful and gertie wrapped in thought scarce saw or heard her companions or the twins at their boyish gambols or the gentleman off sandy mount green that sissy caffrey called the man that was so like himself passing along the strand taking a short walk you never saw him anyway screwed but still and for all that she would not like him for a father because he was too old or something or on account of his face it was a palpable case of dr fell or his carbuncly nose with the pimples on it and his sandy moustache a bit white under his nose poor father with all his faults she loved him still when he sang tell me mary how to woo thee or my love in cottage near rochelle and they had stewed cockles and lettuce with lazenby's salad dressing for supper and when he sang the moon hath raised with mr dignam that died suddenly and was buried god have mercy on him from a stroke her mother's birthday that was and charlie was home on his holidays and tom and mr dignam and mrs and patsy and freddy dignam and they were to have had a group taken no one would have thought the end was so near now he was laid to rest and her mother said to him to let that be a <clears throat> warning to him for the rest of his days and he couldn't even go to the funeral on account of the gout and she had to go into town to bring him the letters and samples from his office about catesby's cork lino artistic standard designs fit for a palace gives tip-top wear and always bright and cheery in the home a sterling good daughter was gertie just like a second mother in the house a ministering angel too with a little heart worth its weight in gold and when her mother had those raging splitting headaches who was it rubbed on the menthol cone on her forehead but but gertie though she didn't like her mother taking pinches of snuff and that was the only single thing they ever had words about taking snuff every one thought the world of her for her gentle ways it was gertie who turned off the gas at the main every night and it was gertie who tacked up on the wall of that place where she never forgot every fortnight the chlorate of lime mr tooney the grocer's christmas almanac the picture of halcyon days where a young gentleman in the costume they used to wear then with a three-cornered hat was offered a bunch of flowers to his lady-love with old-time chivalry through her lattice window you could see there was a story behind it the colors were done something lovely she was in a soft clinging white and a studied attitude and the gentleman was in chocolate and he looked a thorough aristocrat she often looked at them dreamily when there for a certain purpose and felt her own arms that were white and soft just like hers with the sleeves back and thought about those times because she had found out in walker's pronouncing dictionary that belonged to grandpa giltrap about the halcyon days what they meant the twins were now playing in the most approved brotherly fashion till at last master jacky who was really as bold as brass there was no getting behind that deliberately kicked the ball as hard as ever he could down towards the seaweedy rocks needless to say poor tommy was not slow to voice his dismay but luckily the gentleman in black who was sitting there by himself came gallantly to the rescue and intercepted the ball our two champions claimed their plaything with lusty cries and to avoid trouble sissy caffrey called to the gentleman to throw it to her please the gentleman aimed the ball once or twice and then threw it up the strand towards sissy caffrey but it rolled down the slope and stopped right under gertie's skirt near the little pool by the rock the twins clamoured again for it and sissy told her to kick it away and let them fight for it so gertie threw back her foot but she wished their stupid ball hadn't come rolling down to her and she gave a kick but she missed and edie and sissy laughed if you fail try again edie boardman said gertie smiled assent and bit her lip a delicate pink crept into her pretty cheek but she was determined to let them see so she lifted her skirt a little but just enough and took good aim and gave the ball a jolly good kick and it went over ever so far and the two twins after it down towards the shingle pure jealousy of course it was nothing else to draw attention on account of the gentleman up opposite looking she felt the warm flush a danger signal always with gertie mcdowell surging and flaming into her cheeks 
Till then they had only exchanged glances of the most casual, but now under the brim of her new hat she ventured a look at him, and the face that met her gaze there in the twilight, wan and strangely drawn, seemed to her the saddest she had ever seen. Through the open window of the church the fragment incense was wafted, and with it the fragrant names of her who was conceived without stain of original sin, spiritual vessel, pray for us, honourable vessel, pray for us, vessel of singular devotion, pray for us, mystical rose. And careworn hearts were there, and toilers for their daily bread, and many who had erred and wandered, their eyes wet with contrition, but for all that bright with hope for the Reverend Father Hughes had told them what the great St. Bernard said in his famous prayer of Mary, the most pious virgin's intercessory power that it was not recorded in any age that those who implored her powerful protection were ever abandoned by her. The twins were now playing again, right merrily for the troubles of childhood are but as fleeting summer showers. Sissy played with baby Boardman till he crowed with glee, clapping baby hands in air. Peep, she cried behind the hood of the push-car, and Edie asked where was Sissy gone, and then Sissy popped up her head and cried, Ah! And, my word, didn't the little chap enjoy that? And then she told him to say, Papa. Say, Papa, baby. Say, Pa, 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 Pa. And Baby did his level best to say it, for he was very intelligent for eleven months, everyone said, and big for his age and the picture of health, a perfect little bunch of love, and he would certainly turn out to be something great, they said. Hadja, ja, ja, hadja. Sissy wiped his little mouth with the dribbling bib and wanted him to sit up properly and say, Pa, 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 but when she undid the strap, she cried out, Holy St. Dennis! that he was passing wet, and to double the half-blanket the other way under him. Of course his infant majesty was most obstreperous at such toilet formalities, and he let everyone know it. Ha, ba, 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 And two great big lovely big tears, tears coursing down his cheeks. It was all no use soothering him with no 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 baby no and telling him about the g g and where was the puff puff but sis always ready witted gave him in his mouth the teat of the sucking bottle and the young heathen was quickly appeased gerty wished to goodness they would take their squalling baby home out of that and not get on her nerves no hour to be out in the little brats of twins she gazed out towards the distant sea it was like the paintings that man used to do on the pavement with all the coloured chalks, and such a pity, too, leaving them there to be all blotted out, the evening and the clouds coming out, and the bailey light on Howth, and to hear the music like that, and the perfume of those incense they burned in the church, like a kind of waft. And while she gazed her, she gazed, her heart went pit-a-pat, Yes, it was her he was looking at, and there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her as though they would search her through and through, read her very soul. Wonderful eyes, they were superbly expressive, but could you trust them? People were so queer. She could see at once by his, his dark eyes and his pale intellectual face that he was a foreigner, the image of the photo she had of Martin Harvey, the matinee idol, only for the moustache, which she preferred, because she wasn't stage-struck like Winnie Rippingham that wanted they two to always dress the same on account of a play, but she could not see whether he had an aquiline nose or a slightly retroussé from where he was sitting. He was in deep mourning, she could see that, and the story of a haunting sorrow was written on his face. She would have given worlds to know what it was. He was looking up so intently, so still, and he saw her kick the ball, and perhaps he could see the bright steel buckles of her shoes if she swung them like that thoughtfully with the toes down. She was glad that something told her to put on the transparent stockings, thinking Reggie Wiley might be out, but that was far away. Here was that of which she had so often dreamed. It was he who mattered, and there was joy on her face because she wanted him because she felt instinctively that he was like no one else. 
The very heart of the girl woman went out to him, her dream husband, because she knew on the instant it was him. If he had suffered more sinned against than sinning, or even, even if he had been himself a sinner, a wicked man, she cared not. Even if he was a Protestant or Methodist, she could convert him easily if he truly loved her. There were wounds that wanted healing with heart balm. She was a womanly woman, not like other flighty girls, unfeminine, he had known, those cyclists showing off what they hadn't got, and she just yearned to know all, to forgive all, if she could make him fall in love with her, make him forget the memory of the past. Then mayhap he would embrace her gently, like a real man, crushing her soft body to him, and love her, his ownest girly, for herself alone. Refuge of sinners, comfortress of the afflicted, ora pro nobis, well, has it been said that whosoever prays to her with faith and constancy can never be lost or cast away, and fitly is she, too, a haven of refuge for the afflicted because of the seven, of the seven dolors which transpierced her own heart. Gertie could picture the whole scene in the church, the stained-glass windows lighted up, the candles, the flowers, and the blue banners of the Blessed Virgin's sodality, and Father Conroy was helping Canon O'Hanlon at the altar, carrying things in and out with his eyes cast down. He looked almost a saint, and his confession box was so quiet and clean and dark, and his hands were just like white wax, and if ever she became a Dominican nun in their white habit, perhaps he might come to the convent for the novena of St. Dominic. He told her that time when she told him about that, in confession crimsoning up to the roots of her hair, for fear he could see, not to be troubled, because that was only the voice of nature, and we were all subject to nature's laws, he said in this life, and that that was no sin, because that came from the nature of woman instituted by God, he said, and that our blessed lady herself said to the archangel, Gabriel, be it done unto me according to thy word. He was so kind and holy, and often, and often she thought, and thought, could she work a ruched tea cosy with embroidered floral design for him as a present or a clock, but they had a clock, she noticed, on the mantelpiece, white and gold, with a canary bird that came out of a little house to tell the time the day she went there about the flowers for the forty hours' adoration, because it was hard to know what sort of a present to give, or perhaps an album of illuminated views of Dublin or some place. The exasperating little brats of twins began to quarrel again, and Jackie threw the ball out towards the sea, and they both ran after it, little monkeys common as ditch-water. Someone ought to take them and give them a good hiding for themselves to keep them in their places, the both of them, and Sissy and Edie shouted after them to come back because they were afraid the tide might come in on them and be drowned. Jackie! Tommy! Not they! What a great notion they had! So Sissy said it was the very last time she'd ever bring them out. She jumped up and called them, and she ran down the slope past them, tossing past him, tossing her hair behind her, which had a good enough color if there had been more of it, but with all the thing of Mary she was always rubbing into it. She couldn't get it to grow long because it wasn't natural, so she could just go and throw her hat at it. She ran with long gandry strides. It was a wonder she didn't rip up her skirt at the side that was too tight on her, because there was a lot of the tomboy about Sissy Caffrey, and she was a forward piece whenever she thought she had a good opportunity to show off, and just because she was a good runner she ran like that so that he could see all the end of her petticoat running and her skinny shanks up as far as possible. It would have served her just right if she had tripped up over something accidentally on purpose with her high crooked French heels on her to make her look tall and got a fine tumble. Tableau. That would have been a very charming expose for a gentleman like that to witness. Queen of angels, queen of patriarchs, queen of prophets, of all saints, they prayed, queen of the most holy rosary, and then Father Conroy handed the thurible to Canon Hanlon, and he put in the incense, and since the blessed sacrament in Sissy Caffrey, 
caught the two twins and she was itching to give them a ringing good clip on the ear but she didn't because she thought he might be watching but she never made a bigger mistake in all her life because Gertie could see without looking that he never took his eyes off of her and then Canon O'Hanlon handed the thurible back to Father Conroy and knelt down looking up at the blessed sacrament and the choir began to sing tantum ergo and she just swung her foot in and out in time as the music rose and fell to the Tantumere gosa cramen tum. Three and eleven she paid for those stockings in Sparrows of George's Street on the Tuesday, no, the Monday before Easter, and there wasn't a brack on them, and that was what he was looking at, transparent, and not at her insignificant ones that had neither shape nor form. The cheek of her, because he had eyes in his head to see the difference for himself. Sissy came up along the strand with the two twins and their ball with her hat anyhow on her to one side after her run and she did look a streel tugging the two kids along with the flimsy blouse she bought only a fortnight before like a rag on her back and bit of her petticoat hanging like a caricature gertie just took off her hat for a moment to settle her hair and a prettier daintier head of nut-brown tresses was never seen on a girl's shoulders a radiant little vision in sooth almost maddening in its sweetness you would have to travel many a long mile before you found a head of hair the like of that. She could also see the swift answering flush of admiration in his eyes that set her tingling in every nerve. She put on her hat so that she could see from underneath the brim and swung her buckled shoe faster for her breath caught as she caught the expression in his eyes. He was eyeing her as a snake eyes its prey. Her woman's instinct told her that she had raised the devil in him, and at the thought a burning scarlet swept from throat to brow till the lovely colour of her face became a glorious rose. Edie Boardman was noticing it, too, because she was squinting at Gertie, half-smiling with her specks, like an old maid pretending to nurse the baby. Irritable little gnat she was, and always would be, and that was why no one could get on with her, poking her nose into what was no concern of hers, and she said to Gertie, a penny for your thoughts. What? replied Gertie, with a smile, reinforced by the whitest of teeth. I was only wondering, was it late? Because she wished goodness they'd take the snotty-nosed twins and their baby home to the mischief out of that so that was why she just gave a, a gentle hint about its being late and when sissy came up edie asked her the time and miss sissy as glib as you like said it was half past kissing time time to kiss again but edie wanted to know because they were told to be in early wait said sissy i'll ask my uncle peter over there what's the time by his conundrum so over she went and when he saw her coming she could see him take his hand out of his pocket, getting nervous and beginning to play with his watch-chain, looking at the church. Passionate nature though he was, Gertie could see that he had enormous control over himself. One moment he had been there, fascinated by a loveliness that made him gaze, and the next moment it was the quiet, grave-faced gentleman, self-control expressed in every line of his distinguished-looking figure. Sissy said to excuse her, would he mind telling her what was the right time, and Gertie could see him taking out his watch, listening to it, and looking up and clearing his throat, and he said he was very sorry his watch was stopped, but he thought it must be after eight because the sun was set. His voice had a cultured ring in it, and though he spoke in measured accents, there was a suspicion of a quiver in the mellow tones. Sissy said thanks, and came back with her tongue out and said uncle said his waterworks were out of order <laughs> then they sang the second verse of the tantum ergo and canon o'hanlon got up again and sensed the blessed sacrament and knelt down and he told father conroy that one of the candles was just going to set fire to the flowers and father conroy got up and settled it all right and she could see the gentleman winding his watch and listening to the works and she swung her leg more in and out in time it was getting darker, but he could see, and he was looking all the time that he was winding the watch or whatever he was doing to it, and then he put it back and put his hands back into his pockets. 
She felt a kind of sensation rushing all over her and she knew by the feel of her scalp and that irritation against her, stray, her stays that that thing must be coming on because the last time too was when she clipped her hair on account of the moon. His dark eyes fixed themselves on her again drinking in her every contour literally worship, worshipping at her shrine. If ever there was undisguised admiration in a man's passionate gaze it was there plain to be seen on that man's face it is for you gertrude mcdowell and you know it edie began to get ready to go and it was high time for her and gertie noticed that that little hint she gave had the desired effect because it was a long way along the strand to where there was the place to push up the push car and sissy took off the twins caps and tidied their hair to make herself attractive, of course, and Canon O'Hanlon stood up, with his cope poking up his neck, and Father Conroy handed him the card to read off, and he read out Panem de Cello Praestiati Ais, and Edie and Sissy were talking about the time all the time, and asking her, but Gertie could pay them back in their own coin, and she just answered with scathing politeness when Edie asked her was she heartbroken about her best boy throwing her over. Gertie winced sharply. A brief cold blaze shone from her eyes that spoke volumes of scorn immeasurable. It hurt. Oh, yes, it cut deep, because Edie had her own quiet way of saying things like that she knew would wound, like the confounded little cat she was. Gertie's lips parted swiftly to frame the word, but she fought back the sob that rose to her throat, so slim, so flawless, so beautifully moulded, it seemed one an artist might have dreamed of. She had loved him better than he knew, light-hearted deceiver and fickle like all his sex. He would never understand what he had meant to her, and for an instant there was in the blue eyes a quick stinging of tears. Their eyes were probing her mercilessly, but with a brave effort she sparkled back in sympathy as she glanced at her new conquest for them to see. "'Oh!' responded Gertie, quick as lightning, laughing, and the proud head flashed up. "'I can throw my cap at who I like, because it's leap year.' Her words rang out crystal clear, more musical than the cooing of the ring-dove, but they cut the silence icily. There was that in her young voice that told that she was not a one to be lightly trifled with. As for Mr. Reggie, with his swank and his bit of money, she could just chuck him aside, as if he was so much filth, and never again would she cast as much as a second thought on him, and tear his silly postcard into a dozen pieces. And if ever after he dared to presume, she could give him one look of measured scorn that would make him shrivel up on the spot. Miss Puny little Edie's countenance fell to no slight extent, and Gertie could see by her looking as black as thunder that she was simply in a towering rage, though she hit it, the little kinnat, because that shaft had struck home for her petty jealousy, and they both knew that she was something aloof, apart in another sphere, that she was not of them, and there was somebody else, too, that knew it and saw it, so they would so they could put that in their pipe and smoke it. Edie straightened up baby boardman to get ready to go, and Sissy tucked in the ball and the spades and buckets, and it was high time, too, because the sandman was on his way for Master Boardman, Junior, and Sissy told him, too, that Billy Winks was coming, and that baby was to go dee-daw, and baby looked just too ducky, laughing up out of his gleeful eyes, and Sissy poked him like that out of fun in his wee fat tummy and baby, without as much as by your leave sent up his compliments on his brand new dribbling bib oh my pudney pie protested sis he has his bib destroyed the slight contretemps claimed her attention but in two twos she set that little matter to rights gertie stifled a smothered exclamation and gave a nervous cough and edie asked what and she was just going to tell her to catch it while it was flying, but she was ever ladylike in her deportment, so she simply passed it off with consummate tact by saying that that was the benediction, because just then the bell rang out from the steeple over the quiet seashore, because Canon O'Hanlon was up on the altar with the veil that Father Conroy put round him, his shoulders, 
round his shoulders, giving the benediction with the blessed sacrament in his hands. How moving the scene there in the gathering twilight, the last glimpse of Aaron, the touching chime of those evening bells, and at the same time a bat flew forth from the ivy belfry through the dusk, hither, thither, with a tiny lost cry, and she could see far away the lights of the lighthouses, so picturesque she would have loved to do with a box of paints, because it was easier than to make a man, and soon the lamplighter would be going his rounds past the Presbyterian church grounds and along by shady Trittonville Avenue, where the couples walked, and lighting the lamp near her window was Reggie Wiley, used to turn his free wheel like she read in that book, The Lamplighter by Miss Cummins, author of Mabel Vaughan and other tales. For Gertie had her dreams that no one knew of. She loved to read poetry, and when she got a keepsake from Bertha Supple of that lovely confession album with the coral pink cover to write her thoughts in, she laid it in the drawer of her toilet table, which, though it did not err on the side of luxury, was scrupulously neat and clean. It was there she kept her girlish treasures, trove, the tortoiseshell combs, her child of Mary badge, the white rose scent, the eyebrow line, her alabaster pouncet box, and the ribbons to change when her things came home from the wash, and there were some beautiful thoughts written in it in violet ink that she bought in Healy's of Dame Street, for she felt that she too could write poetry if she could only express herself like that poem that appealed to her so deeply that she had copied out of the newspaper she found one evening round the potherbs. Art thou real, my ideal? It was called by Louis J. Walsh, Magerfelt, and after there was something about twilight, wilt thou ever? And oft-times the beauty of poetry, so sad in its transient loveliness, had misted her eyes with silent tears that the ears were slipping by for her one by one, and but for that one shortcoming she knew she need fear no competition, and that was an accident coming down Dalkey Hill, and she always tried to conceal it. But it must end, she felt. If she saw that magic lure in his eyes, there would be no holding back her, for her. Love laughs at locksmiths. She would make the great sacrifice. Her every effort would be to share his thoughts. Dearer than the whole world would she be to him and gild his days with happiness. There was the all-important question, and she was dying to know, was he a married man or a widower who had lost his wife or some tragedy like the nobleman with the foreign name from the land of, of song had to have her put into a madhouse, cruel only to be kind? But even if, what then? Would it make a very great difference? From everything in the least indelicate her fine-bred nature instinctively recoiled. She loathed that sort of person, the fallen woman off the accommodation walk beside the daughter that went with the soldiers and coarse men with no respect for a girl's honor, degrading the sex and being taken up to the police station. No, no, not that. That would be just good friends like a big brother and sister without all that other in spite of the conventions of society with a big S. Perhaps it was an old flame he was in mourning for from the days beyond recall. She thought she understood. She would try to understand it because men were so different. The old love was waiting, waiting with little white hands stretched out with blue appealing eyes. Heart of mine, she would follow her dream of love, the dictates of her heart, that told her he was her all in all, the only man in all the world for her, for love was the master guide. Nothing else mattered. Come what might, she would be wild, untrammeled, free. And that's the end of chapter 13, part 2 of James Joyce's Ulysses.